Okay, good morning, good afternoon. Are you okay? You all seem a bit like, whoa. Why don't, um, why don't we stand and I'm going to pray, if that's okay with you guys, and let's just refocus a little bit. Um, why don't you just turn to the person beside you so you look fantastic this morning. Look great, better looking than the last time I saw you. You could do a bit of a stretch if you want. Well, should we pray? Father God, we thank you um, for this opportunity to to come before you and uh, to grapple with leadership, to grapple with culture, to grapple with all these things. And God, I just want to pray. Just for this next half hour, Lord, I just don't want to go through the motions. We've all spoken at uh, so many conferences over the years. And it's so easy just to um, just go for it and do what we always do. But God, actually, we long for the reality of your spirit. We long for you, Jesus. We long for your spirit to touch our spirit and confirm who we really are. So God, I pray this just won't be an intellectual exercise that we can go through and tell some amusing stories and this and that. But God, you would do something in our lives this morning, I pray, that would leave us different to how we came in. So God, we choose to engage our spirit with your spirit. Lord, we shake off a bit of tiredness. We shake off some of all the information we've had, as great as it's been. And God, we say we long for you, Jesus. We focus, we realign our hearts, and we ask you to speak in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, you can take your seat. Well, it's a real privilege to be here with you, and uh, um, I, 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 we are currently on a tour called Honesty Over Silence around the UK, and, uh, and a lot of people said to me, why on earth would you squeeze in a conference like Ecclesia whilst you're in the middle of a tour and then go into a session called Leading When You're Not Okay? <laughs> and, and it's partly because of Andy, because Andy's my mate and I like doing things for my mate. It's as simple as that. It was as strategic as that. I'm very relational. I like doing things with mates and uh, that's why I'm here. And uh, so I've been asked to talk about Leading When You're Not Okay. And what I wanted to do is, because I knew this was coming towards the end of lunch, is, is just tell you a bit of a story, really. And uh, I was one of those guys, I guess, I was brought up in a Christian family, sort of stereotype Christian, where I really wish I was in a gang at some point to make it more interesting and, you know, all that sort of stuff, because um, that would have helped me in my previous job. But it wasn't, I got to know Jesus really early, um, but it wasn't until I was 16 that I went to a place called Carble City, which uh, at the time was underneath Waterloo Bridge. There were literally hundreds and hundreds of homeless people there. And I remember sitting in a circle with a bunch of them, and one guy had begged enough to go and get a hamburger. And uh, they passed the hamburger around the circle, and they took a bite out of it each. And then they handed it to me. I can't tell you what that did to me. I remember looking up on the walls of Carble City, and someone with big red paint had written these words, Welcome to reality. Welcome to reality. As soon as I could, I felt like I was passionate to get back to London. I went back to my airbed I was staying at that night and said, God, uh, it's a prayer that changed my life, actually. I just want to see the world the way you see it. I want to go to the poor and the broken and the marginalized in our society. Please break my heart for the things that break yours. That was a really painful prayer to pray. And, uh, and so as soon as I could, I moved to Peckham. Uh, it's famous for Only Fools and Horses. Get in. Um, though I've got an 18-year-old worker with me who's never heard of Only Fools and Horses. Can you believe that? I, think, I don't know what young people are coming to these days. And uh, Peckham is amazing. It's about the only place you can buy uh, half a goat and a mobile phone in the same shop. It's fantastic. And, uh, and I, I love it, actually. I absolutely loved Peckham. But starting this work um, in the inner city, I, I saw poor mental health really close up. I remember leading a staff meeting the day after a 15-year-old girl had completed a suicide in the school. Um, I remember um, living just down the road from where a young chap called Damalola Taylor lived, uh, where someone stuck a bottle in his um, leg and the effect that it had on his community, our community. I travelled a lot. I was fascinated. Um, I got mentored a bit by Les Isaac, you know, on street passes, and he took me to Ghana and to, to the Caribbean, suffering for Jesus in the Caribbean, um, uh, India and Kosovo a year after the war. And I saw the effects of 
poverty and the effects of crime and the effects of abuse. And actually, though I wasn't the one going through that, I felt like, and I don't know if you've ever felt like this as a leader, you feel a bit like a sponge because it's really hard to be in those situations and not be affected by what's going on. Last year, I was in Trenchtown in Jamaica, which is one of my favorite places to go. And, uh, and this 30 seconds probably affected me more than most. Um, check this out. I am uh, at this memorial, which says, in memory of children killed under tragic and violent circumstances. And if you look around the memorial, there's just lists of names of kids that have been killed. It's horrible, anyone dies at any age, but like, seriously, four, four, Harvey, age one, unidentified North. I was like, God, what is going on? My wife and I wrote a book called When Faith Gets Shaken Around Some of Our Experiences. And my wife, Diane, um, wrote a chapter in the book called Secondhand Smoke. I don't know if any of you can relate to this. The whole idea is secondhand smoke can still kill you. And, you know, we will go through things. And, of course, you know, I'm not the one going through some of the pain of some of my friends in, in, in Trenchtown or in Peckham and other places that I've worked over the years. I'm not the one going through that, but I'm really close to them. And I sort of feel like I'm breathing it in. I'm becoming a bit like a sponge. And I don't know, leadership for me sometimes felt like I was just trying to spin too many plates, trying to be all things to all people. There are so many different things that we can do. And sometimes when you're really passionate about what you do, you can have this sort of, I'm going to take responsibility for everything. And I knew the issues were too big for me, but I was going to go for it. You know, it's interesting. You can always tell other leaders, listening to other leaders, because they're always on their phones, working or emailing or doing something else. Um, it's crazy, um, because that's what we do. We just spend every five minutes catching up with ourselves. I knew the issues were too big for me. And, uh, and then um, in 2011, I don't know if you remember, the riots um, hit, and suddenly, um, it's typical, uh, I, I met literally every political leader within a week. And, uh, and then they'd get my phone number and they'd be ringing me up. There's one guy, I don't want to mention his name, but he has blonde hair and he doesn't comb it very often. And, uh, and, and you know, I'd be in Sainsbury's and I'd hear, I'd, I'd literally I'd pick up the phone and it would be like, Patrick, why are young people angry? I'm like, hello? <laughs> and then you end up having this bizarre conversation and you think, and this is absolutely nuts. And then, if that wasn't enough, my personal life started to unravel. I needed to have a major operation on my leg. I had a limb reconstruction surgery on my legs, and uh, that was my two different legs. I had my leg broken in three places. You know, Dad got cancer. Things started to happen. And I describe what I think happens for many leaders. It's the Tetris moment. The Tetris moment where it feels like it's all coming too quickly. And you're trying to pull it in a line. And as you pull it in a line, and the whole idea of Tetris, isn't it, is the line disappears. But the reality is, is you can't rotate it quick enough and suddenly, bang, it's game over. Put your hand up if you can relate to this slide. Please, someone else put this um, up. Yes. And uh, so often the showreel looks great, but it's difficult. I think that some of us, what we're like, right, is if you get your phone, your phone will work as well on 10% as it does 100%. True? You can do everything on your phone on 10% as you can 100%. Absolutely. It just doesn't last very long. And what us we do as leaders sometimes, we live like that. What we do is we get exhausted and we plug in for a couple of days and we get up to 10% and then we grab it and off we go again. Yet it's just not sustainable. It's not sustainable to carry on like this. So for me, I had to learn the hard way. And the charity I was running was sort of doing really, really well. In fact, we had a visit from the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. I hope you caught those names as they dropped there. And, uh, and this is uh, my wife, Diane, sitting next to the Duchess of Cambridge. And uh, it's quite a, an amusing story, actually. So the Duchess of Cambridge has just turned to Diane and went, do you like my dress? I'm not sure what you're meant to say when the Duchess of Cambridge says, do you like my dress? And uh, so Diane went, it's a really lovely dress. And uh, she went to um, Diane, well, that's good, because William says, I look like a tablecloth. 
I was like, now you come to mention it, actually. Um, hmm. and, and they spent time with our kids. And then uh, I was saying goodbye to Catherine. And what you can't see in this photograph are literally hundreds and hundreds of photographers. And these photos went around the world. And you know, I was on the BBC Six O'Clock News that day. We went back. These photos went into OK Magazine, Hello Magazine. Magazines in Sweden I'd never heard of. Um, and everyone was texting me going, wow, you're doing pretty good then. The reality is, in this photograph, I'm really struggling with anxiety. And I'm just about to go through one of the darkest times of depression that I've ever been through. But the showreel looks great. And that's the thing we project. Our stories from platforms like this are always the success stories, right? But the reality is people relate more to your scars than your successes. And to be honest, I was desperate. I felt ashamed. I felt like I was going through all of this and it was all my own fault, you know? And the shoulds, the must, the oughts. Have you ever had this? I should be able to cope. What's wrong with me? I've got a family to look after, a team I'm passionate about, a job I love. I must pull myself together. I'm going to let everyone down. I know God loves me, but I can't control how I'm feeling. Be stronger, get a grip, spend more time praying. So, to be honest, I was smashed to pieces and I didn't know how to get out of it. So what I do when I'm in that situation, I tend to write books, which is, I know is a bit weird. And, uh, but I find it really lethargic and uh, therapeutic. And so I wrote this book called Honest Over Silence. And I wrote it because, to be really honest with you, I am fed up with the show. I am fed up with some of our preaching. I am fed up of pretending everything's okay all the time. I am desperate for something with a bit more integrity and a bit more authenticity in its content. And so I wrote the book and I thought, you know what? I'm never going to be asked to speak ever again after this. And, uh, but then I grappled with the Psalms as part of writing this. 40% of the Psalms are laments. Are David crying out to God, I just don't get it anymore, but I'm going to trust in you anyway. And then I started thinking about some of the leaders who inspire me. And they're probably not the people who you'd be thinking of. So the first leader that really inspires me, her name is Rachel Wright. Um, she was involved in leadership in all sorts of different contexts at the moment. Uh, she's been involved in church leadership, uh, leadership in healthcare, all sorts of things. But she has a son that has a life-limiting condition. He has to have 20 injections a day. He is turned every two hours. And I was like, Rach, how does it work? Leading, faith. And she said, it's tough. Because you Christians, you talk a lot about seasons changing. Next season is my son dies. I want to stay in this season as long as I can. But she said, you know what? I have felt God with me at a depth that I've never felt before. My next friend is a massive leader. He, um, in fact, he was a leader of 1,500 police officers in London, in one of the toughest inner city boroughs. Um, he was a borough commander. And uh, um, he's one of my best friends. And he was down A&E. And I presumed he was down A&E because he got stabbed or something happened to him. And, uh, and when I found out the reason he was down A&E is the Tetris moment happened. I went round his house once a week afterwards. And I remember him saying to me, you know what, Patrick? The whole man up thing hasn't worked out very well for me, has it? I was like, it hasn't worked out very well for me either, actually. The next beautiful couple, Alan Jackie Slower, they run a, uh, involved in leadership a church in Candom, uh, Chip in Candom. And uh, uh, they wrote a really tender chapter in the book. And their chapter was about a 16-year-old, their 16-year-old son who completed a suicide. And I was like, I haven't heard this talked about. And I said, why do you want to talk about it? And there went six and a half thousand people in this country complete suicides every single year. Why are we not talking about it? Brené Brown famously says, we are the most medicated, addicted, obese cohort in the whole of history. The culture that we have created isn't working for us. And when it boiled down to it, the reason why I was willing, not willing to say that I'm not okay as a leader is I felt ashamed. And I felt embarrassed and I felt lonely. I felt like there was no one I could talk to. You know, and famously it's been said, isn't it? Shame and guilt are two different things. Guilt is I've done something wrong. Shame is I believe I am wrong. Because I'm embarrassed. I felt like suddenly, fundamentally, it's wrong with me. Brené Brown says, shame has two voices. Who often hears these as leaders? Number one, who do you think you are? And number two is you're not enough. Shame loves silence, secrecy, and judgment. 
And when you get to that place, there were even days where I thought, you know what, I think everyone would be better off if I wasn't here. But the way you step out of shame is you own your story. You become aware. There was, uh, when I was writing the book, um, there was a big issue. My big issue was anxiety, which is a bit ironic given the job that I do. And um, I was looking for a definition of anxiety because I always felt like in anxiety when it was preached about in church was like, um, you know, anxiety is a sin because you're not trusting God enough. And uh, there was nothing positive ever said about anxiety. And uh, so I started to read blogs by normal people. I read a lot of, you know, the theologians, the psychologists, all that. But then I came across this beautiful quote, and I thought, that is me. It says this, more than anything else, anxiety is caring. It doesn't want to hurt someone's feelings. It never wants to do something wrong. More than anything, it's the one and the need to be accepted and liked. So you try too hard sometimes. You try too hard sometimes. That is so true. And then I read this amazing book, which I, if you haven't read it, I really recommend you get a hold of it. It's called Depressive Illness, Curse of the Strong, whether it's for you or for someone in your congregation or the, the organization you're leading. It talks about depression. And the psychiatrist there says nine times out of ten, he can tell the personal characteristics of someone who's depressed. Just look at this list and see if we recognize any of these. Moral strength, reliability, diligence, strong conscience, a strong sense of responsibility, a tendency to focus on the needs of others before one's own, sensitivity, vulnerable to criticism, self-esteem dependent on the evaluation of others. People that struggled with that? Oliver Cromwell, Abraham Lincoln, Mother Teresa, Vincent van Gogh, Winston Churchill. I came to the conclusion that people that suffer from panic attacks, anxiety, depressions are not weak people, they've just been strong for too long. And I think that's the challenge. I was broken, totally and utterly, still am a bit. <laughs> and I came across this image, which you've probably heard of before. It's an image um, where if you break a pot and you mend it, you mend it with super glue and you hide the cracks. And the whole idea of hiding the cracks is we pretend it's not broken. And what they do in Japan is they put a gold powder in the glue, so instead of hiding the cracks, they make a feature of the cracks. Arguably, the object becomes more beautiful than it was before. The word's called kintsugi, it means golden joinery. And I realized that actually our scars are not something to be ashamed of because they make us who we are. That pot, you will not find a pot like that on planet Earth. And uh, in fact, I've got a friend, um, Catherine, um, she's an acoustic artist. And uh, she found out when I was talking about this, she sat down and handmade all these necklaces and pendants and earrings. We've got a couple of them on sale. Um, and she said, take them, they're bespoke. You can't buy anything bespoke these days. And she was in our Kintsugi group and she had this beautiful quote that says this, is that scars make us who we are. Scars make us who we are. Anyway, I want you to check out this video and uh, this is me for 90 seconds having a go at doing the Kintsugi thing. Leading when you're not okay. And it's a tough one, isn't it? Because um, 
there are parts of life I don't think I'll ever be okay. You know, my daughter, she's beautiful. Abigail, she's absolutely gorgeous. Um, she has quite a few additional needs, which, um, you know, maybe she will get healed one day. But actually, it's something that me and Diane are learning to live with and uh, to help her and support her and actually see some of the beautiful stuff that comes out of that because she sees the world really differently to us. But I guess I've learned, uh, I'm learning, should I say, um, some of the things that help you lead when you're not okay. Number one is this, is I've started to realize that courage and vulnerability are the same thing. You may have heard it said that the Latin word for courage is cur. It means to speak your mind with your heart, to show up and let yourself be truly seen. That everything involves courage, involves vulnerability. Brene Brown's famous quote says this, vulnerability sounds like truth and feels like courage. Vulnerability is the birthplace of love, joy, courage, empathy and creativity. It's the source of hope and empathy, accountability and authenticity. If you want greater clarity in your purpose or deeper and more meaningful spiritual lives, vulnerability is the path. You know, we have to be real. You know, Paul, you know, he was a realist. And uh, sometimes the faith guys give me a bit of a hard time, but Paul, you know, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 8 says this, We do not want you to be uninformed, uninformed brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experience in the province of Asia. We are under great pressure, far beyond the ability to endure. So we've despaired of life itself. People don't always connect with your success stories. They connect with your scars. And I actually believe people are desperate for a different type of leader. I don't think they want the sales talk all the time. In fact, my friend Simon Barrington, he's written a book called Leading the Millennial Way. He's the chair of Kintsugi Hopes, amazing guy. And in his research, it said that millennials are looking for three qualities in a leader. Three top qualities they're looking for in a leader. Passion, humility, and integrity. You lead well because of your vulnerability, not despite it. Don't be afraid of being a weak leader who reveals a strong God. Second key thing, and this is really, really important, and I'm sorry I'm rushing through this, but second key thing, this is absolutely pivotal, is that acceptance and resignation are two different things. So we have this sort of 12-week uh, well-being uh, course, um, Kintsugi Hope well-being course, um, looking at emotional and mental health um, in context and small groups all over communities, in the farming community, in prisons, in schools, in hospitals. In the last two years, it's just gone crazy. It's taken off everywhere. It's just been so humbling. But there's this one week on resilience that really got to me as I was doing it. Uh, my wife did some research from Harvard. I don't know if you've seen it. It's a research piece from Harvard. It was how you survive a concentration camp. And what they discovered is that the optimists, which a lot of leaders are, all died within weeks. They didn't last very long. The optimists were wiped out because there was an unreality. We'll be out by Christmas. We'll just have to do this. It's all going to be okay. They died of broken hearts. And, you know, I'm not saying it's bad to be optimistic. Of course it's good to be optimistic. But the people who survived were the people who accepted the situation that they were in and they found purpose in their suffering. They started choirs. They started mentoring people. They started helping people. They were people who stopped saying, why me? And realized, why not me? Archbishop Desmond Tutu says this, we are meant to live in joy. This does not mean that life will be easy or painless. It means that we turn our face to the wind, except that this is a storm that we must pass through. We cannot succeed by denying what exists. The acceptance of reality is the only place from where change can begin. So many leaders, if we're not careful, we just live in denial. You know, I'm preaching a lot on Jeremiah 29 at the moment because I think it's the most taken out of verse taken out of context verse in the whole of the Bible, Jeremiah 29 verse 11, which you all know. And uh, because what, the way it's preached is like, it's all about you and your career and God's got everything good for you. And, and don't get me wrong, I think there are other, you know, there is a sense of truth to that. But actually the context of that verse is that um, Jeremiah is writing that because in Jeremiah 28, Hananiah has prophesied to the people in exile, it's all going to be over in two years. And then Jeremiah comes along and goes, guess what, guys? It's 70 years. You've got to wait 70 years. But in that context, plant gardens, settle down, build gardens, pray for prosperity of the city. I have plans to prosper you and not to harm you. 70 years, accept the situation you're in. And I get so fed up sometimes with sometimes, um, you know, 
Our event culture, which sometimes a big event in a certain year is going to solve all our problems. You know, where is the 50-year plan? I sat in the House of Commons and I said, we need to talk at least about a 25-year, 30-year plan to knife crime. Of course we do. You know, the, my friends in Vineyard Causeway, I, I was with them at, um, a year ago, and they were like, well, we've got a 100-year vision plan. I was like, what? That's ridiculous. We want to work out what we want to change in the generation that's coming up, in our generation, so the generation behind us doesn't suffer the way that we do. Wow. That is serious, hardcore stuff. We've got to accept the situation that we're in. Thirdly, um, I had to learn as a leader that self-compassion and self-indulgence are two really different things. All the things I thought were self-compassionate um, weren't. <laughs> the food, the wine, the Netflix. Um, it was just pure escapism, actually. It wasn't uh, self-compassionate at all. It just made me feel more guilty in the long run. Because self-compassion is this. It's talking to yourself the way that you would talk to your best friend. Do you know, how would you treat a friend who is struggling? I'm guessing you treat them with encouragement and understanding and empathy and patience and gentleness. Instead, what we do, if you're anything like me, I would say things to myself that I wouldn't dare say into someone I love. I wouldn't dare say it to someone I don't particularly like. But I constantly say them to me. Compassion um, means to suffer with, to be conscious of another's pain. Self-compassion and self-indulgence are two different things. And the last couple of things, and this is really important, is that I've started to rethink what I think resilience is. Alan Scott, who many of you would have heard of, says this, the future does not belong to the brilliant, which is great, <laughs> but the resilient. Not to those who avoid scars or pain, but to the wounded healers who choose to give again. Resilience, by definition, is this. It's thriving in the midst of adversity. And one of the things I feel like, um, in terms of my recovery, it really helped me, was that there was a psychologist, uh, Martin Silman. Um, he said there are three Ps in keeping going in terms of recovery if you're going through a tough time. Number one is you've got to deal with this whole thing around personalization. Personalization is the belief that you're always at fault. You know, sometimes I do that. When my kids are doing really well, I think, yes, if they're not doing really well, it's all my fault. There's a lot of things my children do I have no control over. And yet I take it so personally, set such high standards. Abuse, you know, not everything happens because of us. Blaming ourselves on every single little thing delays recovery. Pervasiveness, the belief that an event will affect every single area of my life. When I was going through my surgery, I thought, well, that was it, my life's over. You know, um, I'm gonna, this is going to be four years of my life recovering from this thing. And I came to a point of going, you know what? This is a big part of my life, but it's not the whole of my life. My family is still here. My wife still loves me. I'm still alive. I still have friends. I can work a bit. And permanence, telling ourselves that things will never get better. I think doubt is really healthy at times. Healthy doubt. You know, not make something your identity. We've really tried to drum this into our kids now. So Abigail, um, she was like, one of the things I fear the most in life is when Abigail comes up to me and goes, Dad, I want to cook. I think, oh, no, you are kidding me, because the mess is incredible. And I'll be like, Abigail, you are such a mess. And she's really got into this now. She's going, Dad, I'm not a mess. I just happen to be making a mess. <laughs> yes, but tidy up. But the thing is, she's right. You know, actually, we make these things. It's not permanent. It's not permanent. Hope is saying all things pass. Nothing lasts forever. And the last couple of things, and this comes out of the Dallas Willard stuff, which I think has already been mentioned, is number five. If we're going to be carrying on as leaders when we're not feeling okay, we have to somehow not just talk about ruthlessly eradicating hurry. We actually need to do it. Because my experience is every leader I go up to, I go, how are you doing? And they're like, busy. And then sometimes I go, wow, you said that last time. Yeah, yeah, but I'm really busy this time. And, and you know, it's challenging. And I think Dallas Willard's thing is really interesting because he said, actually, busyness in itself isn't a bad thing. Hurry, on the other hand, is something completely different because it means you don't have time for people. And I think our values are really important. You know, hurry is the greatest enemy of our spiritual life in our day. You must ruthlessly eradicate hurry from your life. 
Some of the stats, I'm sure you've heard these. iPhone users touches his or her iPhone 2,617 times a day. Each user is on his or her phone for two and a half hours over 76 sessions. If there is a secret to happiness, it's simple. Be present to the moment. The more present we are now, the more joy we tap into. So here's a question I like to ask myself. What is success? What does success look like to you? That's fascinating um, when you start asking leaders that. I've come to the conclusion that success looks really different to me to what it did 20 years ago. Is success for me is now I want to live in line with my values. My values. The reason I'm here, actually, I love all you guys. I'm here because of Andy. He's my mate. He asked me. I want to do it because one of my values is friendship and relationship. I'm living in line with my values. So I will be busy today. And maybe I'll hurry a little bit as well. <laughs> but the thing is, live in line with your values. And the last thing, and I guess this is just a reminder, is to constantly live for an audience of one. Um, ages ago now, we had a visit, the charity I was running from Archbishop Desmond Tutu, which out of all the people I've met, that was my favorite. And uh, he came down. And uh, to cut a really long story short, he spent time with our young people. He was brilliant. He's, you know, he's 81 year old, um, broken man. None of our kids knew who he was, which was hilarious. Um, not a clue. In fact, at the end, one of them went, oh, it's really nice of Trevor McDonald to come down and uh, <laughs> hang out for the morning. And uh, it's like, yeah, good old Trev. And uh, but, um, there was this moment, there was this moment where me and him were on our own. And it wasn't for long. And, uh, and he turned to me and he said something that really impacted me. He said, Patrick, the one thing you've got to remember is you make God smile. Now, the problem with that is I've done a lot of public speaking over the years. I mean, you know, small crowds, big crowds. And I've told this story that's about five minutes when I tell the whole thing. I haven't got time. But you know what? Um, I've stood in front of five, six thousand people and I've lied. You're thinking, what? I knew we shouldn't have listened to him. I said to all these people that Desmond Tutu said to me, XLP, which is a charity I used to run, make God smile. He never said that. He said, you make God smile. But I didn't want to accept it, put all the glory, you know, all the stuff onto the charity, because it's, it's all about charity. And yet, maybe as we come to that moment at the end of our time before we break to lunch, maybe there's this thing that God says to you as a leader, Forget everything you do for a sec. You make God smile. You, just for who you are. And you know, when Abby, my little girl, comes into the assembly hall, I don't know if you've ever done this, when you've gone to see your kids in the assembly, um, they come in and they stand on stage, and Abby, Abby's got a visual impairment, she struggles to see, so she's more anxious normally standing on stage and stuff. Um, the one thing she's looking for is my eyes. Um, and you can see them, that they're looking, and all the, parents, all the kids are all looking for their parents' eyes. And then something really happens, it happens in every assembly that I've ever done, is once they meet their parents' eyes, they go... <laughs> and then you look around, and all the parents are doing exactly the same. <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant. And, uh, and it's funny, isn't it? When Abby sees her father's eyes, everything's okay. I'm learning to go into a room and not worry about the hundreds or thousands of eyes that are on me as much these days. I'm looking for my father's eyes. I'm looking for my dad's eyes. I just want to do what he wants. I want to see a change. And you know what the father does? Is the father cries of us. He doesn't always give us the answers we want. That night in Trenchtown, when I was absolutely devastated, I thought, this is it. This is the straw that breaks the camel's back. Um, that memorial I showed you in a little video from, which is a longer version on our website, but this is actually the picture of the memorial um, coming up here. And uh, there's not a photo of it, no. <laughs> we haven't got the photo. There it is. I don't know if you could see the picture behind. Um, and it was almost like I was looking into the face of God at that moment. That's how he responds. That's how he responds to the heartache and the pain and all those things in the world. That's how he responds. And you know, the most famous psalm, isn't it? Psalm 23 that we all 
know so well, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, it's like we get into faith and faith seems all black and white and it's all good. Then we get to that place where uh, we go through the valley of the shadow of the death and, you know, he doesn't signpost us around it, he goes through it with us and everything changes. And, and you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Faith doesn't go back to being all wonderful again. It says, actually, now I'm going to lay a table for you in the middle of your enemies. Faith changes, emerges. I want to finish this quote uh, and then we're going to pray. This is um, one of my favorite quotes. Uh, Henry Nguyen says this, Nobody escapes being wounded. We're all wounded people, whether physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. The main question is not how do we hide our wounds so we don't have to be embarrassed, but how can we put our woundedness in the service of others? When our wounds cease to be the source of shame and become the source of healing, we become wounded healers. We become wounded healers. You make God smile.